Welcome back everyone, it's Paul Tilly. This is EC1210 Macroeconomics and we're looking at part two of unit two today which is the quest for equilibrium and measuring this concept of national income. What exactly do we mean when we think about equilibrium? Well, from our last section we looked at this idea of the circular flow. And the circular flow looks at the flow of money and goods and services between the business sector and the household sector. Now, as we set it up, originally we had two of these sectors and it was a closed loop, meaning that the money flowed from one to the other and from the other back to one and the services flowed from one to the other and the other back to one. So it created a cycle that was closed, nothing went in and nothing went out. So it was a continuous, continuous flow. Further though, we added three issues that come to play. And that is people have savings, people import stuff from other countries, and people pay taxes. Those things, savings, imports, and taxes, pull money out of that closed system. In other words, it's a leakage. We also have three additions to the flow in the form of investment. People take their savings and they invest it. They put it back into the flow. People export stuff. When we export stuff, money comes back into the economy. And government spends. So that, that entity of government throws money into the economy. So we saw that those three things, the investment, exports, and government, add money to the continuous flow. So if we're a closed loop without any leakages and without any money being injected in, it would be fine. It would always be in equilibrium. But because money gets drained out and money gets put back in through those things that were identified, the economy can, or that economic cycle, can shrink or grow, depending on what happens. And when it shrinks or grows, we say that it's not in equilibrium. In other words, the money coming in and the products going out don't necessarily match anymore. So, Ideally, the Bank of Canada, we would like a situation where everything is in equilibrium, meaning that investment, government spending, and exports, and savings, taxes, and imports match. That's not always the case. And we see here in this particular graphic here that if investment, government spending, and exports are greater than savings, taxes, and imports, we're going to get economic growth. Why is that? Because more money is being injected into the economy than is what's being taken out of the economy. However, if we have leakages, in this case, investment, government spending, and exports are less, not as much money coming into the economy, as is savings, taxes, and imports, money going out of the economy, tends to slow down the economy, drains money out of it, and we run into what's called a recession. Things slow down. We can look at it too from another perspective in terms of the value of production. What we're talking about is really this flow is that producers receive revenues as they produce and sell products. Those revenue be the same as how much buyers are spending. So the household unit in equilibrium spends money to buy goods and services. And that will match the amount of goods and services that producers are producing. The value of production then is really the total sale. If we think of the value of production, that is going to be, from a producer's point of view, the total income that they make. So the aggregate expenditures, all the stuff that people spend on stuff, is going to match all the money that goes into businesses making stuff. So aggregate expenditures will equal total income at equilibrium. So why we bother measuring national income? Well, the thing is, if you're a government, you want to know how well the economy is doing. Because if, if the economy is slowing down, government can free up money and put money into the economy and get the economy to speed back up again to bring it back to equilibrium. If the economy is doing too well, too many dollars chasing too few goods, it will tend to drive up prices. What government can do in that case is increase taxes or reduce spending, and that will reduce the amount of money, slow down the economy. So, National income is really a leading indicator to be able to tell government that, yeah, things are going well or things aren't going so well. So we got to be able to measure national income. What do Statistics Canada, the Bank of Canada, what do they do in order to measure this? You know, what kind of measuring stick do they use? Well, what they do is they 
look at it from one of two perspectives. The first perspective is something called the expenditures approach. And the expenditures approach, as the name suggests, looks at aggregate or total, summed up together, expenditures. And that includes things like consumption, stuff you and I buy and consume, gross investment, which is really the stuff that businesses buy, and government spending. So we've got government throwing money into the pot. Those spending bits from consumers, from business, and government are key to the expenditures. Now we also have to throw in net exports, which is the difference between imports and exports. And we want to be able to, to calculate net exports. So effectively, aggregate expenditure is a total of consumption by households, investments by business, spending by government, and net exports, which is exports minus imports. We can also use another approach called the income approach, which looks at money coming in. So alternatively, we can add up the incomes of the three major sectors, the household sector, the business sector, and the government sector, add it all up, and in equilibrium, that will match total expenditures, as we've seen. You know, we, we just talked about aggregate expenditures, and we know from the, the circular flow that if it's in equilibrium, what people buy and what companies produce will be the same. Officially, the terminologies that are used in economics and by the Bank of Canada is something called gross domestic product. A gross domestic product is really the value of all final goods and services produced in a period. What do we mean by final goods? These are goods that are finally going to end up in your hands, you the consumer. Uh, Non-final goods will be like the production of car radios that get put in a car that you're going to buy. So the, the car radio becomes part of the car that you buy. That's not a final good. A final good is the, the car itself, the, the thing that you buy. We also have gross domestic income, which is the total earnings received by household businesses and government in a period. So how do Statistics Canada really measure GDP? Well, they use the expenditure method, which is looking at spending by the three basic levels. So we got spending by consumers. So consumers go out and buy stuff, and this could be durable goods, stuff that lasts a long time, non-durable goods, stuff that's consumed right away, and services, okay? So we add up the total consumer. And then we say, okay, let's look at investment, which is the spending by business. So let's add all that up. You know, capital goods, for example, machines, tools, construction equipment that they buy. That's, that's what's called investment that, that businesses make. We also want to add in how much government spends. The spending levels by government should be easily quantified. And we add net exports, which is the difference between exports and imports. We also have net domestic product. And when we think about net domestic product, what we need to do with net domestic product is consider some of the things that we need to take off from this. So we need to take off depreciation. Now, depreciation is the decrease in value of capital goods over time. So net invest is, is simply the gross investment less depreciation. We got to consider indirect taxes. It's just sales taxes that business collect for government. So it's not really generating anything. It's just collecting it on someone's behalf. So our net domestic product then is the value of production after accounting for depreciation and indirect taxes. So net domestic product is the gross domestic product, less depreciation, less indirect taxes. We also have something called net national product. And if a foreign corporation operates in Canada, some of the profits are going to be transferred out of the country. So as foreigners may work in Canada, some of their earnings are going to be earned abroad. So net national product accounts for this by taking the net domestic product and adding or subtracting the net factor, uh, foreign factor income, which is basically uh, making an adjustment for foreign income. We can also look at measuring gross domestic product from an income perspective, okay? And from an income perspective, what we're doing is doing exactly the same thing. We should get the same answer as we got with the expenditure method. It's just we're looking at the income side. So we're looking at um, compensation for employees, gross operating surpluses for business, gross mixed income for business, taxes, net of subsidies on production, indirect taxes, and if we can do that, we should get exactly the same answer for both of them, be it the in-expenditure method or the income method. We also have a little explanation there, personal income. And one of the things you've got to think about personal income is your gross income. 
And your disposable income, though, however, is the net income that people take home after income tax and payroll deductions. So disposable is really what you have left after those deductions are taken away. So you can see that measuring GDP is challenging. You've got to be able to add up a lot of different things, be using the expenditure method or the income method. So there are some problems with it. What are some of the problems? Well, first of all, we need to exclude intermediate goods. That car radio that got put in the car, as I talked about, so we don't want to be double counting. We got to talk about sales that are merely a transfer of ownership. So selling your car to your child, for example, buying or selling stocks or bonds, public transfer payments, welfare, income, private transfers, gifts. The, these don't add any value. Secondhand goods. We recognize that there's a lot of sale of secondhand goods in the economy. We got to think about, too, other weird things that happen in our society, such as underground activities, illegal ones, you know, legal, legal transfers to drug trade, for example, unreported activities, people doing stuff under the table, non-market activities, such as services provided by the householder. If you fix your own kitchen sink, if you had a leak, you know, that that's doing work yourself or volunteer services. Governments need to spend a lot of time considering net national income. In terms of economic growth, what do we want to do? Well, we, the goal of all governments is really to increase the real GDP per capita. That is, the gross domestic product per person. Okay, That's how we measure productivity in our, in our society. The idea is that as time goes along, we would like our workers to produce more per person over time. That increases productivity and that increases our national wealth. We also have to think about the difference between what's called nominal GDP and real GDP. Nominal real GDP is, is a number. The number that is spit out when we actually do this calculation. So it's the value of GDP in terms of prices prevailing at the time. But we also need to adjust for inflation. So real GDP is the value of GDP measured in terms of prices prevailing in a given base year. So what it does is it automatically adjusts for inflation. So we're comparing apples with apples when we compare one year to the next. So sources of economic growth, where do they come from? Higher quality labor resources, higher quantity of labor resources. Generally in Canada, we're looking to add quality as opposed to quantity. The amount of physical capital available, more money to create more things. Technology, technological change will increase your ability to make more with less. You know, if you think about a, a hammer versus a pneumatic hammer, right? You can put in a lot more nails with a, a, ha a, 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 a pneumatic nailer than you can by driving the, the nails by hand. And the amount and quality of natural resources, we find more Hibernius or more Hebrons. That's going to add the value of stock of, of items that we have. GDP can get too high, though. could result in some problems in our world, you know. Um, maybe result of increased value of some services that were previously excluded. Is, is quality of des desirability of goods produced any good? You know, we might be making a lot of stuff, but if it's junk, what difference does it make? Um, our, our time, our leisure time has to be valued in there. And... Um, it doesn't really account for distribution of income. Is the rising tide floating all boats? What's the social and environmental costs of higher GDP? Can't ignore those. So, bottom line, circular flow is, uh, circular flow is important to understand. So, bottom line, you need to have a good understanding of circular flow and how it works. We have to understand that equilibrium is preferred. In other words, we want to make sure that the value of goods and services that are floating around in that circular flow remain the same. The amount of goods produced and the amount of goods that want to be purchased is like the same. There's lots of accounting rules that can be used in order to calculate GDP. We talked about two, expenditure method and income method. And measurement important sources of problems and economic growth come into play. We have some measurement issues and we have some problems that result from economic growth where not everyone benefits the same.